For our midweek services this Lent, we are looking at the, at the traditionally termed first table of the Ten Commandments, the ones at the beginning that deal with the service we owe to God. Last week, we considered the way that people tend to hurry past this part of the Decalogue, especially the first imperative, you shall have no other gods, in order to get to the second table, the part that tells us what we owe our fellow man. Unbelievers do this because that's the part of the law that makes sense to them. Believers do it because they figure that's the harder part, the part they need to work more on. But both groups are wrong to do it. We never get past the first commandment. We are constantly tempted by other gods, and especially by the greedy idol of our own self. And we never violate another of those commandments except by first violating the first. If we could wholly and consistently have the Lord as our God and fear, love, and trust in him above all things, everything downstream would sort itself out. May God have mercy on our souls. Tonight we turn to the next two imperatives. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. By the traditional Western way of counting, we're still talking about the first commandment because all three imperatives at the beginning have to do with having no other gods beside the true God. In the commandment concerning the Sabbath day, for instance, we see the same thing happen. There are three consecutive imperatives, but they add up to one commandment about the Sabbath day. You're probably aware, though, that here in the first commandment, there is a difference of opinion. The Eastern Orthodox churches and our non-Lutheran Protestant friends count you shall not make for yourself a carved image as the second commandment rather than part of the first, which of course throws off all the numbers then after that down the line, giving rise to all sorts of misunderstandings. I have to mention that to head off confusion, but I don't want to get hung up on it because counting isn't really the point. Whether we call it the second commandment or the second part of the first commandment, the fact remains that God prohibited old Israel from making statues as focuses and props to receive their worship. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. And if you think about it, it's a necessary commandment because otherwise what would stop any idol worshiper from saying, oh, don't worry. My statue is a statue of the God of Abraham, the true God who brought us out of the land of Egypt. I'm not worshiping another God besides him. I'm worshiping him by burning incense in front of this magnificent statue of a whatever that I have made to represent his virtues. And that's basically what the Israelites did right off the bat when Moses was detained on Mount Sinai and they prevailed upon Aaron to fashion a golden calf for them. When the calf was made, they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And don't be fooled by the plural. That's the Hebrew word Elohim, which is grammatically plural and sometimes does mean gods or heavenly beings, plural, but is also used throughout the Old Testament with singular verbs to mean God, singular, the true God. Although the calf worshippers said, these are your Elohim, there was only one calf. They may have been confused whether God was a single entity or some sort of fellowship of entities, but they were not intending to worship some different deity than the one who had brought them out of Egypt, the one who had sent the plagues and parted the Red Sea, the one who just the day before, or 40 days before by this time, I suppose, had caused the mountain to burn with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom the mountain that still had that unnatural cloud on top because Moses had not yet returned. They were not trying to worship a different god. How stupid do you think they were? And King Jeroboam, in our second reading, when he makes his golden calves, he's doing the same thing. He doesn't say to his 10 tribes, hey guys, we've been worshiping the wrong gods all along. Come worship other better gods. He says, this is the same thing as before but now in two convenient new locations. You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your Elohim, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. 
He knows he can't match the splendor of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, so he goes for something modest, but still gold. He goes for a statue to focus on instead of just an abstract altar in front of a house. A more personal, concrete experience. A more universal experience, like how the other nations do their worship. But the same Elohim, I guarantee it. After all, he knows what's in our hearts. He knows what we mean. He can receive our worship here or in Jerusalem, to a calf or at the temple. And in both cases, they were trying to approach God by a path that God had forbidden. It was common practice in Egypt and Canaan to make idols to give the worshipers a focus for their devotion. But the God who had remembered his covenant with Father Abraham and had brought them out of the land of Egypt by actual miracles had also explicitly commanded them, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Yes, you are ignorant of me. You are foolish and stubborn, but I will be patient with you and I will continue to teach you my ways. But in the meantime, you must not approach me the way you would approach demons and the figments of your own imagination and the way the heathens do. And here our first reading comes in because we read from Deuteronomy tonight, we read from Deuteronomy tonight instead of Exodus in order to hear Moses restate the commandment against graven images and explain it. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. Why were they forbidden to make an image of God? They saw no form. God has no form that they could copy. And why were they forbidden to depict him according to the likeness of any of the things that they could copy? Because he's not like any of them. Anything that exists in three dimensions and time and space, anything you can imagine, anything you can understand, is not God. God is beyond it. God is above it. God is not any of the things that he has made, no matter how wonderful a certain thing may be. He is not all of the things that have been made, despite their astounding variety and number. He is the creator. And if you attempt to depict the divine nature, you are on a fool's errand. It can't be depicted. He can't de be depicted. And whatever you do end up depicting, since by definition it has to be a creature, will be an idol. Regardless of your intentions, every time you pay divine honors to it, every time you focus on it as a way to direct your thoughts to God, you will be bowing down to and serving an idol. When the Israelites held their calf festival at Mount Sinai, and when Jeroboam offered sacrifices before his calf, they claimed to be worshiping the God who had rescued them from Egypt. That was the premise. That was the propaganda. Most of them probably even believed it, but they weren't. They were worshiping a creature. They were worshiping the work of their own hands under a fiction. And this is why the Northern Kingdom was destroyed, as we chanted in our psalm. And then the southern kingdom eventually went into exile for the same reason. This is the perennial sin of Israel, of old Israel, our parents. And it's the same thing whenever people today, modern people who would never bow down to a physical idol, prefer their own conceptions of God to the way that he has revealed himself in his word. The God I believe in would never do that. The God I believe in would never say that. But he did say it. Oh, I'm sure God agrees with me. We fall into this sometimes ourselves when we forget his word, especially if we starve ourselves of that word by spending all of our time on the concerns of this life. And God is not amused by such false worship. This is what killed the northern kingdom of Israel. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. 
May God have mercy on our souls. Well, what about the crucifix? What about this one and this one? Are they carved images? Well, technically, maybe they're cast images made in a mold. But I wouldn't try to fit through that loophole. This is God we're dealing with, not the Department of Public Works. Why is it OK for them to be the center of our attention while we direct our worship and praise to God? This is a man. And a man is most certainly a creature. Are we, despite our best intentions, worshiping and serving the creator rather th the creature rather than the creator, as St. Paul says of idolaters in Romans chapter 1? No, not at all. We are worshiping and serving a creature. That much is true, but not instead of the creator. This creature, Jesus of Nazareth, is the creator. This creature, Jesus of Nazareth, was the one all things were made through, without whom not anything was made that was made. He is the word of God, who is in the beginning with God. He was God and still is. He was the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. God became man for us men and for our salvation. The creator became a creature, one with a body, and so a form and likeness that could be depicted, and an appearance that could be marred beyond human semblance, as the prophet Isaiah foretold of the suffering servant. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see. The prohibition of statues clarified for old Israel that they could not use images in the worship of God and still be true to the great commandment, you shall have no other gods. And it gives us, as new Israel, insight into the significance of the incarnation, that God should bridge the vast gap between the creator and the creature, between infinite and finite, in the person of his son is mind-bending. It fundamentally changes the way that men can approach him, the way that men can view him, the way that men can think about him. And that he should do so, not only to give us a focus for our worship and a model for our virtue, but a sacrifice for our sin, is as amazing all over again. You shall not make unto you a carved image, the Lord God of Israel says. I will make for you a natural image, a living image, born of your flesh and blood, to shed that blood and lay down that flesh and die and live again and remake you into his image to make you partakers of the divine nature. Brothers and sisters, God has had mercy upon our souls. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the world. In the name of Jesus, amen.